Good morning, class. Uh, I am not certain what happened on Monday where the lecture that we had did not record. So uh, I'm gonna record again. Uh, most of the things, uh, again, we uh, went over with pretty copacetic and have been covered in other classes. But as we get into the research, I wanted to be sure that um, you know you all had this information available to you. As always, uh, these will be posted uh, both to the course site and to the YouTube page that you should have a link for. Um, and being able to complete, uh, I'm sorry, not being able to get up to speed with all this uh, material. Please make sure that you're reading as well. This will be the last uh, uh, session, the last day that we covered chapter one. And we'll get into chapter two and from there we move pretty swiftly. So make sure that you have your Cengage access and make sure that you're reading according to the schedule laid out in the syllabus. Make sure you're reading according to the schedule laid out in the syllabus. Make sure you're reading according to the schedule laid out in the syllabus. One of the more pertinent things you'll find in this chapter is uh, the introduction of a concept of, that we call a theory. I can absolutely assure you that all of you all are, um, have had theories about something. Uh, why uh, older siblings behave so differently than uh, the youngest child. Um, a theory about um, why certain professions are, uh, you know, overly dominated by men, such as engineering and mathematics. Uh, theories about um, why does it seem that the uh, impact of uh, hurricanes is becoming a little bit more severe. A theory, obviously, hopefully, uh, with uh, us being in the midst of a pandemic. You probably have uh, given some thoughts about that um, explain people's behavior and even the spread of the pandemic itself. So with this in mind, what we try and do with the theory is describe, explain, and predict social events, particularly as it relates to some degree of, uh, of scientific cause and effect. As we discussed before, um, a theory, um, like with the examples given, whether we're talking about the, uh, the intensity of hurricanes, whether or not we're talking about, you know, uh, engineering being an overwhelmingly uh, male-dominated profession, or whether we're talking about how, on average, uh, older siblings, no, the oldest child generally uh, has uh, personalities that are at sharp contrast to youngest children such as myself. In all of these cases, students, we don't believe that things just happen for a reason, that there's just, you know, a coincidence. So, um, as scientists, we generally don't believe, um, you know, in, in coincidence for the most part, for the most part. There are some coincidences for sure. But before we chalk something up to a coincidence, we want to make sure that we go through all the steps and trying to get an answer to this um, as quickly as possible. My beloved Chicago Cubs had not won a World Series in 108 years before uh, the year 2016. There are many theories of why that had occurred, including that uh, the Cubs were a cursed team, that uh, they a black cat had crossed and uh, went past their dugout, and uh, that created bad luck for them. Maybe that's true. More than likely it is not, as uh, black cats have walked past all types of folks who continue to have good fortune. So with those explanations not being fully satisfactory, we try and like, you know, use uh, our reasoning ability, our logic, and what we have observed to be able to explain uh, you know, cause and effect. Because again, we don't believe that social phenomena just happen out of, uh, you know, thin air. There's some reason. One of the things that you're going to begin on your journey of doing is that there's some topic that's probably of interest to you. You're going to set out on a journey to try and unpack and explain the reasons why uh, something or uh, is happening or occurring or something that may happen based upon uh, your, uh, what you have logically concluded and what you have been able to uh, scientifically, scientifically observe. But I keep this concept theory up here for a nice minute 
because it's really important to you. Everything that we're going to do as social science students over the next few years. Again, this is used to describe, explain, and predict social events. So we can uh, make certain predictions about, you know, uh, racial tensions, for example, based upon um, the election in November. Probably however it goes. Some of the major uh, theoretical perspectives within sociology include the functionalist, functionalist perspective, the conflict perspective, and symbolic interactionism. These are the three major theories uh, historically. More recently, postmodernism has also been introduced. And all these theories are attempted to, again, what the theory does is attempt to explain cause and effect and describe events explain why they happen and predict what will happen in the future. According to postmodernism, the other theories that we have mentioned, functionalism, symbolic interactionism, and conflict theory, are not fully sufficient in explaining social life. But what all these theories are trying to explain is um, how and why the societies that people live in operate in the way that they do. So these are, these are theories that explain cause and effect. So again, where we see some countries where um, using, using masks to combat COVID uh, is done in uh, really high numbers. Here in America, it's, it's been more challenging. We don't believe that these differences um, are impossible to explain. We believe that we can use science in the social research process to be able to unpack why these differences occur. Because if we understand why these differences occur, we can then potentially prevent them from happening. Um, in this case, for the sake of everybody's good health. Let's move on. So we began talking on Monday in the part that uh, I foolishly uh, was not able to record. The theory and the research cycle. Again, let's go back to what a the theory does. And make sure, class, when you're doing this on your own, if you're looking at this uh, on YouTube, if you're reading this in the text, it's going to require you sometimes going back and reviewing. This is going to be the case when you're in your junior and senior year, and even in graduate school, where sometimes you may need to go back and kind of refresh your memory a little bit regarding to, uh, certain concepts that are being introduced. So we talked about what a theory does. What the research cycle uh, speaks to is how we formulate theories that a theory about, you know, so I could have a theory that um, that uh, applesauce will cure you of the coronavirus. I can have that theory. Or I can have that belief. It is not a theory until I go through the work and go through this cycle that we're going to describe in a moment to ensure that my conclusions that applesauce can cure you, cure you of the coronavirus. Before I can introduce to the public, I need to go through very rigorous processes to make sure that what I'm saying is as accurate as possible. Otherwise, I can put some bad information out there. And if I'm telling people that you can, uh, you know, uh, cure COVID by, uh, you know, eating applesauce, then obviously people will make those choices. But if my information is false, I'm providing people with bad choices that's actually going to make a social problem that affects all of us worse, not better. So although we begin by talking about theories, uh, the important point really to introduce is a hypothesis. Well, hypotheses, because you can have more than one. Can anybody out there tell me, in your own words, what is a hypothesis? And what does it do? What is a hypothesis and what does it do? Excellent class. As you alluded to, a hypothesis is an educated guess, an educated guess. And listen to that word there, educated guess. There are a lot of really uneducated guesses out there, but an educated guess should come from, again, what makes sense logically and then what you have observed. So, for example, there's uh, 
a notion that education is correlated with life expectancy. That in general, and look at that word here. So again, you see on the screen, the final thing you see, right? I'm trying to highlight that it's not letting me. But the, right before you get to the theory center cycle, you see generalizations, generalizations. I'll um, break this down in more detail in a bit, but the important thing to remember here is that you're making a general statement. In science, just as in life, there are always um, exceptions to the rule. There are always exceptions to the rule. So on average, uh, smoking tobacco will lead to um, uh, reduced health um, outcomes, particularly as it relates to uh, your respiratory system. On, on average, in general, Tony, Tony, Tony was right. Well, let me be more accurate. Well before most of you all were born, Tony, Tony, Tony saying, it never rains in Southern California. That's not true, but it rarely rains in Southern California. We can observe this with our own eyes and we spend time there, but there's also a lot of data out there that measure such things. So to say that it never rains in Southern California probably would be a scientifically uh, inaccurate statement. A better way of saying it rarely does, because there are always exceptions. Here in Columbia, South Carolina, I don't think, no, I don't think that it has actually snowed in a time that I have been here at Allen, here in Columbia. I've seen some in Charlotte, but I've not seen any in Columbia. So in general, we can make an accurate statement that uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, it usually never snows in Columbia, South Carolina. We cannot say it never does, because I'm sure across thousands of years, it has at some point. And even if it's no one time, we can no longer say that this happens every single time. What we can speak to is generalizations. In general, your income will be higher the more education that you have, in general. There are many exceptions across this planet, such as Jay-Z, Oprah Winfrey and LeBron James, they fly in the face of that. But we don't want to look at the exceptions. What we want to speak to in social science, in science more broadly, our generalizations, what generally happens, what generally happens. So let me go back to my hypothesis and educated guess that. Initially, when COVID began, I had an educated guess that this would probably be something short and brief. It probably wasn't that serious. I remember flying in mid-March and I saw people wearing masks. I kind of thought they were silly. We've seen many, this was based upon, this educated guess was based upon me having observed several times throughout my life uh, illnesses and viruses that pop up every few years. I mean, this is going to happen. It's a living and breathing planet, and viruses and bacteria are part of that. So those things are always going to be present with us. My educated guess, based upon what I had observed previously, is that this will be a small thing, and then, you know, it might just be, you know, isolated to a few countries, but here in America, we'd be able to carry on. That was my educated guess in March. It was educated because I based it upon what I had observed and then things that I had read and just my general knowledge of uh, viruses and, uh, and, and how they spread. Here today in September, I'm at a different place. I'm not going anywhere without wearing my mask and I try and be around as few people as possible. That's because since that time, there have been a lot of observations that I've had directly and that for people who are scientists, not, not politicians or game show hosts or your, uh, your aunt who works at the post office who has all types of like uh, fantastical ideas about modern medicine. All those opinions are, 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 you know, are valuable. But those are not educated, informed responses. 
much like I cannot give you an educated, if, if your car is, uh, you know, uh, experiencing some kickback, I can make some limited observations, but that's not my lane. I am not trained as a mechanic to be able to give you a definitive conclusion about what could be wrong. So you listen to me, you know, you might get lucky and get the right information. More than likely, you may be a little bit jacked up. So we want to really like, you know, lean on, you know, experts within these things. Not that experts can't get things wrong. Even with the coronavirus, they're going to get things wrong. Um, you know, so we, we, like I said here, there were hypotheses about how it spread. Uh, one of the things we heard initially was that um, on land base, if you uh, touch something that, you know, uh, somebody that was infected would touch. Um, I think from my understanding that still is at least a mild concern, but that is not the primary rate of transmission. There were hypotheses introduced that this was not an airborne uh, disease, which seemed a little bit ridiculous to me, but again, uh, I'm a social scientist, not a natural one. So hypotheses, again, are educated guesses. You then have to test your hypotheses through observation and through social research. So again, you see the research cycle. So the main component of the research cycle, and please uh, be uh, mindful, young people, these four points you see here, these four points you see here, theories, hypotheses, observations, and generalizations, this is not the complete set of the research cycle. So do keep that in mind. We'll talk about all the steps here in a moment. But after you have formulated your uh, thoughtful hypothesis, that allows a hypothesis that allows you to measure some cause and effect. So I'll just throw one out off the top of my head as again related to COVID. I hypothesized that uh, that at some point South Carolina will experience another shutdown. I hope I'm mistaken, but I hypothesized that at some point South Carolina will experience another shutdown. This is based on my observation that in spite of like, you know, uh, people continuing to die and get sick, very many of our fellow citizens continue not to take this very seriously. And even those who are, you know, uh, habits are very tough to break. I, I can, um, you know, there have been many times where I've been going to stores or even coming here on campus and I have gotten out the car and just going on my merry way and I've had to double back and go get my mask because that's not been my habit throughout, you know, um, my entire life. So even if I want to do well, even for those who want to do well, you know, those habits are very difficult to break. And then unfortunately, there are many amongst us who have no interest in doing well. Based upon that observation, I anticipate that, you know, another shutdown may uh, be imminent. But again, I hope I'm mistaken. There are many hypotheses like these as, we, as it is expected by most in the scientific community that in November, December, we are likely to experience another spike. The good news for us is that we don't have to only rely on the scientists that we can observe what happens. So keep this in mind because I can assure you, all of you all in some capacity are scientists already. I'm just giving you terminology and skill sets that will allow you to perform uh, scientific research um, more efficiently. There are two, um, when we look, when you start the research process, you begin to collect data. That's the information that's going to allow you to see if your hypothesis is right or wrong. So again, I made a hypothesis that at some point, the state of South Carolina will experience another sh uh, COVID related shutdown. I can look at this in two, I can analyze this in two ways. Quantitatively, quantitative just deals with numbers. So we can look at, so I'm sure there are surveys that measure the percentage of people who um, report wear, self report wearing a mask every time they're in public and the percentage that do not. Those are, not, again, we're dealing with numbers. We can look at numbers that show uh, the rate of hospitalizations 
in the state of South Carolina here in uh, the first week of September this year compared to uh, two weeks ago, a month ago, or even the first week of September last year. But the main thing to remember here is that you're dealing with numbers, 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 numbers. For my sports fans out there, well, actually, let me hold that example, then I'll come back. Let me stick with COVID for now. I also made this hypothesis that we'll experience a shutdown based upon my qualitative observations that have nothing to do with numbers. In conversations with people, sometimes really intelligent people that still, again, uh, believe that um, this thing is a hoax and, and and we're doing major damage to the economy and uh, allowing people to die. For what purpose most of the people that you know uh, support this hoax haven't really been able to explain this to me to uh, one thing I've heard is to control the population that we kill people, then um, the government can have population control. I can assure you the government has much more efficient ways than uh, of doing that than this, if that's something that they wanted to do. So based upon these conversations, based upon what I have observed in my own eyes, where I see again, people uh, continuing to, uh, again, it's gotten a lot better than it was like, you know, in May and June, but there's still um, a sizable number of people who do not wear masks, don't believe it's necessary. And I don't trust these businesses to enforce their mask policies um, that are in place now here in South Carolina as they are in many places. So qualitative goals just kind of like, you know, uh, measurements, you can measure it, but it doesn't involve numeric measurements. Let me give you a couple of brief examples here to illustrate this point. For my sports fans out there, quantitatively, Michael Jordan is often like, you know, uh, known as the GOAT because of his six, there's a number, six championship rings and going six and oh in the finals. But quantity, but I don't think that's the reason why he's the GOAT. To me, young people, he was the greatest basketball player I had ever laid eyes on when he just had one championship. The championships help. But it's not a way, it's not the most perfect way to measure a player's value. Qual qualitatively, there are things that we can see, we can look at that don't go into numbers. So again, just in looking at all the different things he could do on the floor, that's what made me feel like he was the best basketball player that um, anyone's ever seen, quite frankly. Even if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has more points, even if LeBron James changes teams like eight more times so that he can catch up in championship rings. I've seen them both play. So no comparison in, in, in the view of uh, most who've seen both play, like who's the better player. And that is no diss to LeBron at all. He's awesome. A more pertinent example, whether or not you're a sports fan or not, might be related to like physical health. We can look at somebody's physical health and we can measure this in certain ways. We can measure their, again, numbers. We can, like, there's a number that shows your cholesterol level. There's a number that shows your blood pressure. There's a number that shows how much you weigh. But oftentimes, people might be um, get the false illusion that because those numbers are, you know, uh, uh, can appear pretty well across the population, that people are healthy. I have known people that have been real thin, that have had heart attacks and strokes. Now, usually, let me be clear, usually, if those numbers are high, if you're, if you're overweight in terms, again, numbers, numbers now, numbers, numbers in terms of pounds you weigh, in terms of uh, your rate of hypertension, in terms of your cholesterol levels, that's usually going to translate into qualitative things that we can see. Um, qualitatively, again, if somebody has swollen ankles, I can see that. I may not know what their like, you know, diabetes uh, rate is or cholesterol level, but ankles don't get swollen like that for nothing. You know, my sister dealt with stuff like that through most of her adult life. Uh, 
her weight uh, or weight can absolutely be a barometer. But there are some times where, again, you may gain weight and it might not necessarily be related to bad health. Uh, for women, when you're pregnant, um, I know that at times past when I've had to use certain medications, uh, particularly those that have steroids in them as asthmatic, um, I have to use prednisone sometimes and it, it's going to put some pounds on you. If I'm having shortness of breath, and even that we can measure. So like uh, there, there are peak flow measures that we can do quantitatively. But we, even without the peak flow measure, if I take five steps and I'm, <gasps> that probably suggests that something quantitatively that there's some numbers that can tell us why I am breathing this way. Why am I getting more headaches? So numbers, again, and being able to measure those things as um, a physician will, uh, when you go get your checkups, when you go get your physicals. And please, young black people, make sure that you're routinely going to the doctor. It's very important. Because oftentimes, people will do the reverse. That qualitatively, they feel like, hey, I'm healthy. I'm, nothing's wrong. Since they don't see anything. And there might be some quantitative things going on that you know you should give attention to. We'll talk about this in much more detail. I know it's a lot here. Again, I beg and plead of you to read the textbook because I think that they'll give you a lot of really good examples of both of these categories and to give you a deeper understanding than you know a PowerPoint um, lecture would. After you have read this stuff, after you reviewed the lectures, I highly encourage you again to schedule some uh, virtual uh, office hour meetings with me where we can talk this stuff out a little bit more um, thoroughly because I know um, you're getting hit with a lot of information. So we talked about, again, I told you before, right, the research cycle. And as I talked about before, there are many more steps there. Figure 110. This is not figure 110 from my PowerPoint slide. This is taken directly from your textbook. When students oftentimes will tell me that they're in, look, I am totally patient with you not understanding something. I am patient uh, with you needing a little bit more clarity on a given concept. I have very little to no patience at all for you not actually doing the work. So please make sure that you're reading and utilize the book and utilize diagrams like this to help you get a better understanding of what you have read. So again, and deductive and inductive method, don't stress over that too much at this stage. Put it in your mental Rolodex. Um, Y'all have no idea what a Rolodex is. Uh, put it in your mental bank. Um, to make sure that you can file it away later. In your mental file cabinet, there we go. Because you will revisit these concepts again, although not as much in this particular class. But as, as I've talked about from the beginning, John, this class is a building block for other classes that you'll have regards to your major. Every student at Allen has to do social research, has to do research, has to complete a thesis statement in order to graduate. So these steps that are laid out here, you'll do as well in you know, the natural sciences. One of the first things you want to do, again, is review the literature. Ideally, again, right, so, you, so even though I talked about this, you may formulate a hypothesis. And that's true, that you'll have some sense about, you know, uh, what explains cause and effect. So again, in using my hypothesis that I, uh, my educated guess leads me to believe that there will be another shutdown in South Carolina before the end of the calendar year. My sense is that I'm probably not the, and well, I know in this environment, I am not the only person who's wondered about these things. So I feel very, very, very confident that a lot has been written on this topic already. These scholars who've written on this topic already have saved me a great deal of time and potentially helped me to uh, prevent some mistakes. There's virtually nothing new under the sun. So as brilliant as you all are, 
almost any topic you can think of has been covered at some point in some capacity. Your task here and the main thing that you'll have to do is to begin to look through sources related to your particular research topic. Most of these steps in here, I want to, um, again, uh, rest easy. Most of these steps here you will not have to do in this class. You will not have to do in this class. Every step on here you will have to do before you leave Allen University, almost any university in case you end up transferring. Please, please, please follow along. I don't expect you to understand everything right away. Right away. So um, I hope that you avail yourself to some office hours in coming days and weeks. Hypothesis again. I said an educated guess, and let me expand upon that. It's an educated guess related to the relationship between two variables. Between two variables. Again, I said cause and effect is at the heart of theories in uh, scientific research. So most any social research uh, project will have an independent and a dependent variable. So um, I talked about before how education is tied into, in fact, let me do something else real quick. I apologize, young people. And I think I have some uh, ready-made examples that may even improve upon what I was about to say. As brilliant as that probably was going to be. So let's go back real quick. Oops, my bad. And looking again at our definition of uh, independent and independent variable. I spoke before, right, that uh, this is related to scientific cause and effect, scientific cause and effect. Variables is what allows us to measure these cause and effects. So the independent variable causes the effect the dependent variable is what's affected. Please, again, again, listen to me, young people. These concepts are not going to be made clear just by the in-class explanation or reading this PowerPoint 25 times. This PowerPoint is a, is a very abbreviated summary of these concepts and uh, things that are talked about in this section, in this section of the uh, chapter. But within the textbook, they're going to flesh each of these concepts out more broadly and, uh, you know, really uh, go into depth in explaining them. And also provide some examples. So let me give you a few that I hope will make this a little bit more clear. Give me just a moment. I'm going to change my screen share. And pull up something else. So again, right, we talked about independent, independent variables, independent, independent variables. Here, we're trying to test and measure cause and effect, cause and effect. So you'll see here in each of these examples, the independent variable and dependent variable. The more education one has, the more likely that is to cause an individual to vote. The more attractive a person is according to their culture standards of beauty, and each culture has unique standards of beauty, but the more attractive a person is, according, and again, look at that word culture, that's gonna be our focus on chapter two. So please make sure that you see how these concepts build off one another. Some of y'all have, um, you know, I, I, I'm presuming have, kind of like, you know, taking the first couple of weeks off and okay, I can catch up, that, that, that's challenging. But you can't just jump into chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, without going through the early chapters, it's not gonna make as much sense. So the more attractive a person is according to their culture standards of beauty, the higher their income. 
a child's success in school, elementary, junior high, high school, has been found to be correlated. And look at that word there, correlation, correlation, correlated. We don't say cause. A child's success in school has been found to be correlated with the number of books the parent has in the home. A child's success in school has been found to be correlated with the number of books the parent has in a home. So again, here, and you see I got them reversed. The number of books the parent has in a home will have the effect of them doing better in school. Are there exceptions to this as we talked about in the beginning of the class, young people? Absolutely. There are always scientific exceptions. But in general, and, and one of the things, right, I want you to like, you know, think about again, because I, I need you to begin to put on your social scientific hat. Read, make sure you read these points very clearly. Because I didn't, the, the uh, relationship that's explored, explored here says nothing about whether the kids even read the books, but just the presence of the books in a home. The child early on gets a visualization that education is, so, uh, is important. And the things that are stressed in school are reinforced at home by the parents uh, having these kind of things in place. The, war, the more they one smokes cigarettes, the more likely the effect is that they'll develop lung cancer. Are there exceptions? Of course there are. There are people who smoke two packs of cigarettes a day who may not develop lung cancer. There are people who have never smoked a day in their life who might. Science is tricky. Here's the independent dependent variable that I hope that you'll uh, pay uh, great heed to. The more hours that students put into studying, the more likely that the effect of that will be that students will get better grades. So again, independent variable. That, and one of the things I want you to see is that these two variables affect one another. They affect one another. They affect one another. So your level of education has an effect on how often you vote. How beautiful you're considered to be has an impact upon um, your uh, higher income. Study these closely again. Uh, I think of the things we talked about so far, this is probably one of the more challenging ones. So I hope that you avail yourself uh, to this information a couple more times um, as we go forward. All right, let me, uh, a couple more points and then uh, we'll get ready to uh, close out for the day. Let me see here. So yeah, in your textbook as well. And pardon me as I switch from screen to screen. They have many hypothesized relationships between variables. So causal, the more depressed individuals get, or the more depressed a society or group gets, the higher the suicide rate goes. So again, we have to be very mindful in this year where it's been quite a bit going on to say that at the very least. A lot of people again will um, have to deal with bouts of depression and we'll see what that means for the suicide rate for our country. There are some things though that cause, like again, one of here, like item C here, please look at this. Again, we probably will not get that deep in this class, but keep in mind what this illustrates is that usually, well, almost rarely can we explain any social phenomena for one reason. To say that, um, you know, that COVID is, um, you know, for example, only caused by like, you know, uh, open up the borders of China, uh, that may have played a role. Likely it did. To say that's the only reason would be a, dis uh, a bit you know, inaccurate. So usually there are several things that impact um, behaviors. So if C, multiple cause explanation that the rate of social change is really high right now. The poverty rate is increasing. Uh, our, our country is becoming more religious where a lot of times uh, Issues like this that we may deal with will be dealt with within our spiritual base. 
all of these things are combining to increase the suicide rate according to this model here. So usually most social uh, phenomena can be explained by multiple factors. You'll only be asked to do one here. So one of the things that I like to, uh, you begin to think about, what social relationship would you like to see studied? Think about this long and hard, and we'll begin uh, our class uh, later today uh, talking about this in more detail. I thank you for your time. I apologize for the technical difficulties, and uh, this should be loaded onto e-learning and uh, your YouTube page soon. Peace to you and yours.